What's it like making clothes for other people? Mary Quant, well-known fashion designer. Well, money. Um, I mean, I started in this workroom making hats, you know, two pounds ten a week for, for rich people who were duchesses and lady this and lady that, who went to Ascot, you know. And it would take me five days to make one hat for one lady blogs to go to Ascot, and it would rain, and she'd bring it back the next day and say, my husband doesn't like it. And the whole thing, you know, it got through to me that this was sort of unrealistic, out of date and nonsense. That, it, that one person couldn't spend five days making a hat for one woman, and that we lived in a mass production age, and that we, we must um, make mass production clothes, and that they must um, not cause all that sweat, blood and tears at two pounds ten a week. Casual coat by Bellstar, lined with four glue. Raincoat by Weathergay, this has an Antron outer fabric and Dacron fiber fill padding. The collar in Dunbar seal. If there's one thing we all do, it's to wear clothes. Some of us make more fuss about it than others. Some prefer satins and silks, others denim. But whatever our taste, we all spend time and effort and money choosing clothes in which we feel comfortable and in which we hope we look attractive to other people. But who decides what we're going to wear? What's it like going to work in the industry known the world over as the rag trade? Well, today I've come to one of London's big hotels to see a fashion show. And out there, the experts are looking critically at the clothes the models are wearing and trying to decide what you and I might buy. Let's go back then to the very beginning and take a look at the textile industry which provides from the basic raw materials all the many fabrics from which our clothes are made. Fabrics that could start their life in a number of different ways. In a test tube, for example, the so-called man-made fibres like nylon and rayon produced from chemicals in the laboratory. Or like cotton as a plant grown overseas. Or near a home, perhaps, wool from the many different breeds of sheep reared in these islands. Each breed gives a different kind of wool, different quality, different textures. And sorting one from another at the mill calls for a skill and experience that's the result of a long and intensive training. We're going to take a look at wool being put through all the processes that go to make up the finished cloth. Washing, combing, twisting, spinning and weaving. It's pretty well the same story for cotton and the man-made fibres too, but with certain essential differences at some stages in the process. But whatever fibre is used and whatever finish is required, the basic traditional crafts of spinning and weaving go into the making of every piece of cloth. Crafts that haven't basically changed in over 2,000 years, except that, as in every other industry, Machines are now doing the work of hundreds of people. So the fibre is twisted and spun in hundreds of different shades and colours, thicknesses and textures. Reel upon reel of yarn that will be blended and woven into cloth for coats and suits and dresses. Now although machines are used to produce the vast amounts of cloth needed each year by the garment industries, it's the people who set the machines who are really important. 
There are a wide range of skills employed in all parts of the textile industry, and training is a question of passing on traditional skills from one generation to the next. The textile world used to be limited, of course, to certain parts of the country, like Lancashire and the West Riding of Yorkshire. But modern developments, especially the rapid expansion in the field of man-made fibres, has led now to an industry that's almost nationwide. Although it's now highly mechanised, weaving remains the basic art of laying one set of threads at right angles to another, the warp and the weft. The resulting weave can be plain or patterned. That such beautiful patterns can be created is a tribute to the artists and engineers working in the textile industry. And so the cloth takes shape. A lightweight suit for the tropics, an overcoat for winter. Hundreds of different patterns destined for thousands of different people. But this is only the beginning. At this stage, the cloth can be made into anything. What eventually appears depends very largely on the skill of those people who can sew one piece of cloth to another to produce anything from a ball gown to a balaclava. If you had worked in the clothing industry in days gone by, you might well have found yourself sewing by hand with a group of other people in an often dimly lit small back room. In some ways, things haven't changed very much. A great deal of the day-to-day -day work, on samples at least, is still done by groups of people working in small back rooms, but usually better lit. Like everyone else, though, the clothing industry has been forced into mass production, perhaps not necessarily for the best, but with millions of garments to make each year and styles that continually vary, the majority of the large manufacturers tend to run their clothing factories like any other factory, on a production line basis. Cloth in one end, Patterns cut, machined, sewed, pressed, packed, and out at the other. Off they go, dresses for women all over the country, perhaps the world. Big women, little women, thin women, fat women. The competition in the rag trade is fierce. Business is carried on at a frantic pace. Styles, patterns, colours, ideas that change by the week, even by the day. Manufacturers who hope that their lines will be the most popular ones are often surprised or shocked. There's no accounting for public taste, but in this one area of London alone, perhaps a thousand organisations try to persuade the public, you and me, to buy a better, gayer, lovelier life. And so the clothes finally reach the shops. Behind the glass, a glimpse of the glamorous you of tomorrow. Of course, some people are too young, or perhaps too worldly wise, to be fooled by this sort of thing. When it comes to buying clothes, there are those who don't have to worry how much money they spend. They get the very best attention, the most courteous service, the personal touch, but they often have to pay for it in hundreds of pounds. It is, after all, an exclusive pair of design, madam. I know one does like to be noticed, but I'm always afraid of being a little too daring. These ladies usually have very generous husbands, and with dresses at that price, they need them. Of course, you don't have to be rich to spend a lot of money on clothes, but it does help. That looks nice over pink one. Did you try them on? Yes, they look super. Long sleeve mauve vest. Um, we haven't got any long sleeve ones at the moment. The trouble is, somehow, that you can't put a price on fashion. If you're going to be a trendsetter, well, you've got to pay the price, even for the most insignificant piece of clothing. 
Well, they, do, they do vary. When you think that last year as a nation we spent almost 2,000 million pounds on clothes, it makes you wonder if our vanity is worth that much. But you might not only be a customer, you might decide you'd like to work as a sales assistant in a clothes shop. Not an easy job. You've got to be polite, helpful, and often you must try to understand the customer who's not sure what he wants anyway. Um, it's got uh, the gingham collars, a cuff mm. collar. This is the dark blue one. Uh, I don't think this is necessarily your colour. What, what colour jacket is it to go with? Um, sort of white, off-white in linen. Yes, well, I think we've, we've got a large range of shirts here. There's various colours. I think you might like better this sort of thing. The, the paler blue, I think, might turn in better with your jacket. This has got the stitching that I think you you rather like. This double stitching here, fly fronts, mm. double cuff, with the well finished. You notice the finish on the on yeah. the cuffs there. Mm. We've also got a bespoke department here, you know, shirts to measure. Mm. You can make mistakes if you're too keen to help. If you ask the right questions to begin with, you won't waste your time or the customers. Would you like to come this way, please? Thank you. Have you any particular colour in mind, no. something like this? Perhaps? Nothing particularly. I'll try that for a start, anyhow. Well, I'll check the size anyway. Right, thank you. Let me take that for you, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. What does that think? Well, it fits all right, but it's a bit short, isn't it? I'll get my trousers wet if I'm not careful. This coat is very fashionable at the present moment, of course. Yes, but no, it's, it's too short for me. I, I'd like to try a longer one, please. Yes, a pleasure. Thank you. You see, if only you'd found out what was wanted right at the beginning. Good afternoon. Can we help you at all? Anything special? Selling clothes to ladies can be a problem. They ask your advice, but they don't really want it. They can't afford a dress, but they buy it just the same. And they expect you to help calm their anxieties. You become an advisor, but people won't trust you. They know, as you do, that it's your business to sell. Isn't that nice? Yes. And belted, so you can either Navy use it without a belt or around the waist. This is very smart. Hips, you know, also being best. reduced, ma'am. This is four nineteen and eleven. Yeah. Reduced. We've had great success with that one this year. It's, a it's really style. worth trying because simple. they're really. The fashion business never stops. Clothes for every occasion, every pocket. A style, a shape, a colour for everyone. Antonelli. Well, that line looks like being very popular. The textile industry provided the cloth, and obviously it's been very well made. But who decided on the cut and shape of the particular garment? That's the job of the designer, a job which calls for a variety of basic skills. And until a few years ago, most of the basic designs, for women's clothes at least, seem to have come from Paris and Rome. But lately, British designers have been more than holding their own, especially in clothes for younger people. And what's more, giving our exports a thoroughly good boost. What's it like being a designer of clothes? What sort of training do you need? Is it as glamorous as it seems? Well, most of the time, you're working in a small room with samples of cloth all around you, a dummy, a sketch pad and a pencil. Sometimes you work on your own, sometimes with other people. Slowly, you begin to try out ideas that may be next year's fashions. Or may not. But make sure that the shoulder strap is the same width as the bodice line here. And um, the other thing. That Pat's experience is typical. Seven years study to become a designer, and at first she saw her ideas rejected or used by somebody else without getting any of the credit. She wants to run her own fashion house. But is it so easy? I spoke to several young designers and asked what had happened to them, what they thought about their work. As soon, yes, as soon as I left, I went, well, I went to evening classes to learn cutting because I, I knew it was what I wanted to do. And my first job was in a workroom. I knew one just had to learn something about it. And it was two pounds ten a week. And um, that was tough because I had to live on it because my parents kept saying, you know, uh, what do you expect if you will do something as silly as fashion? 
Um, you must put up with it. Again, quite rightly, you know. Yes, well, I started at uh, Provincial Arts School, did a three-year course there, in which I learned sort of cutting and making, sort of all the technical side. And then I went on to the Royal College from there and did, and did, and did an extra three years. So, it, so, you know, I've spent six years studying, so it's quite a long study period. Um, well, my education, I had a secondary modern education after failing the 11 plus. Um, I did a few jobs after that and then went into the National Service in the Navy. After coming out of the National Service, I went to art school, stayed there for two years, and then took the entrance to the Royal College of Art, and I stayed there for one year, and then left the Royal College. I started in a, a small bespoke workshop in South London, and I learned sort of cutting and tailoring and all the practical and technical side. And from there, um, I left. I, I think I spent about 18 months there. And I left there and I t attended Shoreditch Garment College for the clothing industry. Well, I think the, the first thing you must have is obviously finance. Um, uh, I, I'd been going for about three months, and I, and I realized that you, you just can't do a thing unless you've got money. Anyone who's going into business must um, be prepared for this sort of this sort of thing that's on, on you all the time. You, you, you can't relax. Uh, you, you can't have holidays very easily like people think you can. You're working all the time. I mean, it's, it's all right doing things, you know, sketches and doing things on paper, but then you've got to sit down and, and get to your form and get to your line. And this is what you've got to convey to a machinist. And I think clothes are going to be made in a completely new kind of way. And should be, indeed. I mean, they should be made like fiberglass motor cars or or bottles. They shouldn't be cut and sewn together. We shouldn't have man-made fibres that, that imitate wool by being turned into a thread and then woven with weft, what are they called, noise. So, you know, you could, in fact, it's absolutely possible already, to take the chemicals, to have the formula for the mould, which is like a bottle, and to more or less shake it up and, through scientific processes, produce the garment, you know, in all the different sizings, without seams. Perfect finish. Well, there we are. A vast industry, a hectic one, and an eye always on the export market. An industry that is often brilliantly inventive and sometimes extremely superficial. And if you think there's a place somewhere along the line for you, you can rest assured that wherever you live, there'll be some branch or other of the rag trade. Pay can vary enormously, but there's nearly always some form of training available, and promotion is there if you've got the enthusiasm and the ability. Now, for those with artistic ability and a sense of color or line, the world of the designer or buyer could be open to you, but it's a pretty tough road. You need detailed training and a capacity for hard work. So the next time you buy yourself some more clothes, just give a thought to all the people and to all the techniques directly or indirectly concerned with the end product. Would one of these jobs be right for you? As always, it's your decision. Uh -huh.